the last seminar is going to be with uh, Robin Symbolis. It's uh, social media for social practice and an early art world adapter to social media and a former longtime editor of Art News, Robin Symbolist has spent her career helping arts professionals to communicate effectively. Over 16 years at the helm of Art News, she shepherded the century old magazine into the digital era, expanding its global and multicultural content and training generations of interns, writers, and editors. In 2014, she launched her business, Robin Symbolist Editorial Strategies, working with museums, foundations, galleries, and social justice organizations to design and implement mission-based content strategies. She speaks often on social media and career development at schools and residencies and offers webinars for artists on the platform, VV workshop, like workshop, but VV workshop dot art an award-winning investigative journalist who has published widely in the art and mainstream press, Symbolist is best known today as at our Symbolist, handle of her popular Instagram and Twitter feeds. Robin, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for those other presentations. I learned so much. Um, so I was excited to do this presentation because I've been doing this Instagram for artists class for years. And I realize it's kind of object-based, not that social practice and object-based are mutually exclusive, right? Because if you think of some of the biggest names in socially engaged art, like the Astor Gates and Titus Kapar, they both just had big shows at Gagosian branches in Chelsea. So it's not like it's one way or the other. Anyway, for the purposes of the conversation, I put together this blurb, um, defining it as where art meets activism. Now, some people call this artivism. It hasn't really caught on, but I like it, so I'm going with it. Um, so I'm saying using creative strategies to help change hearts, minds, lives, policy, and the world, working in communities, collaborating with colleagues in other fields, where the process and human connections are usually more important than the finished project. And I just wanna stop there for a minute because one example of this might be like, say you make a painting of a shark with his stomach open and there's all this plastic in it. That's an example of bringing attention to a problem. But what we're talking about here might be like if you organize an event where people go to the shore and they pick up plastic. Now you might show the plastic as a piece in a gallery, I've seen that, or you might see documentation of people involved in this project together, but that's not necessarily the main mission of the project to come away with these sculptures made of plastic. And then consciously done in the context of art. Now it's art, I'm good with that. You say it's art, it's art. The question though, is when you're doing social media on this, again, in this larger community of change makers, how are you gonna indicate it's art when you don't wanna fall back on your international art speak that you've been using in your art forum and your studio visits? So like, here's one way, Tanya S. Arte, Tanya is art, this is Tanya Bruguera. And this is the Cuban artist. Now she's not, this isn't her main strategy. It's kind of a one-off, but she's very adept on social media, but it brings up a very interesting issue. Here we have a screenshot of a more recent, this is a recent, um, this is her Instagram grid. Oh, by the way, she's one of the artists who does use the term artivism. She founded the Hannah Arendt Institute of Artivism and Social Change in Havana. But what's fascinating about this is that this is a new way of connecting with the public, right? In the past, if she wanted to draw attention to the surveillance state, which she's clearly doing here in her grid, she would have had to go to the mainstream means of distribution. She would have had to get the attention of a writer, of an editor, of someone on TV, or she would have had to buy an, have to buy an ad. And now for relative little money, we can communicate with people all over the world. So what are we trying to do here? I wrote number one, build community and authentic relationships. Now I even, I had this before the pandemic the same and I can just say now more than ever over and over but this is the long game, especially with these kind of projects that never ends sometimes because we're dealing with large world issues. 
Yes, we're trying to share our identity, our projects and our causes. We're trying to attract the attention of writers, curators, people who are gonna give us money to make art, gonna give us a place to make art, people that we can make art with. We're gonna use this to monitor news and coverage. And then we're gonna use it to actually think about how do we actually use the social to make the change happen. So a lot of people ask me for a formula. They wanna know like how many a day and how many hashtags. And I'm like, sorry, no can do. Here's the formula, spend time on social media. So now you're saying, thank you, Robin. I already spent time on social media doom scrolling. And I'm like, no, spend time on social media seriously. So spend some time, monitor and follow, right? Interesting people, institution and news sources. That's how you're gonna figure out how many hashtags to use among other things. Connect with people that you meet in jobs and projects and events. Again, I had this before, but this is so important now that we're so much more separated. And then maintain, update your bio, your photos, your highlights, et cetera. Now, mm -hmm. I too am guilty of this. I have some space junk out there in terms of my social, but I'd still best practices is to get rid of the old stuff. Next, learn to use your phone as a tool. Here we have a post from Dia V. She was at the Highline now. She's a creative time. As, all right, it's a screenshot of a video. The point is, if you don't know how to shoot on the phone in, in film and video, you got to practice. It's the only way to get better, right? And then when you post it, you're going to be cropping and editing them for each platform. And then with these large projects, and again, this kind of reiterates and fits in with what we heard earlier, you got to plan for the images in advance. This is an image-based medium. All right, just very briefly, choose your platforms. Step one, Facebook. I know this does not say Facebook. Okay, I had one Facebook. This is the end of Facebook because I feel at this point, you don't need to get on Facebook if you're not on it. And if you're on it, then you can decide if you want to stay on it. I don't think you need it. LinkedIn, I think you need. And the reason is this, there's not that many artists on LinkedIn, but this is where people find, this is like Facebook for work. People can find you for panels, people can find you for projects, but if you're gonna use it, you don't gotta post, and it doesn't have to say a lot, but you wanna spend some time maximizing what I like to call the real estate. So let's just look at Natalie Jeremijenko for a minute and we see her profile photo. You can see that on her face, there's a large bug. I think it's a beetle. That's what we might call an identity signifier, right? Like you don't see a beetle in most people's pictures and she's giving it this kind of deadpan side eye. So she's kind of signaling that she works in nature somehow, one would think, right? And then again, this is backed up by this large backdrop. And the reason I say this is that if you're trying to get those public projects, those public commissions, they don't you, don't, you can't necessarily apply for them. The people sometimes ask you, so you, you're constantly thinking in your social, how do I put myself in the space? How do I situate myself in the space where I would be considered planting the idea in people's head? Basic marketing. Twitter, yes. Why do you need to be on Twitter? A, if you're ever involved in a controversy, that will not be the time to learn Twitter. B, the people that you're trying to reach, a lot of them and connect with, which include journalists, but activists, the foundations, the people in the Rockefeller, the Ford, Bloomberg, across the world, they're all on Twitter. Um, and a lot of your partners, if you're working in social change and climate change and decarceration, they're on Twitter. And the third reason is that even though it's the most difficult to use, I think it gives you the most tools to curate news in your, to read it in your own time. I'm sorry, I said curate, so it slipped out. Um, so these are screenshots of different lists. Twitter gives you this feature where you can create or follow a list which are different categories, right? Like, um, so on the right, I think this was Planned Parenthood. In the center, this came from, I did this today and I already forgot. I, I feel like it's from, Green, it's from Greenpeace, right? And then on the other, we see the other. So the point is this. When you're working in social practice, you're often moving around. You're moving into different cities. You, you, you collaborate with people in different causes that you, and, that you didn't know about before. And we all know the stories of people who are in social practice and kind of come into communities in other cities. And they're like, hi, I'm here. You're welcome, right? There's a name I forgot. I call it, you're welcome. 
So this is another way you're going to, if you're in Kansas City, wherever you are, you go in here, you go into these lists and you can immediately figure out who's in town and who's doing what, right? And if you're trying to reach journalists in this subject that you're writing about, that's all going to be in here. I mean, that you're making art. Huh? And finally, Instagram, where the, I wrote, not that the other artists aren't on the other platforms, but this is where this art conversation is happening, right? And I have one here from Jesse Crimes. And what's interesting about this very briefly is that he's talking, these are textiles created in collaboration with formerly and, in, and currently incarcerated people from Pennsylvania. And they're in a show, they're, they're on display as a part of my Voices from the Heartland project. The, the quilts were handmade by members of the Amish and Mennonite community in Lancaster, only two days left. So the first thing he's doing is saying, what are you looking at? I love this. This is where the main point is in the first two lines, right? Why do we care? It's in a show. And then he gives more details. And then at the end, he said only two days. He doesn't start the thing like two days. Don't wait if you're in Pennsylvania, because that's kind of like empty calories. He's telling you right away, why is this interesting? Crafting your content strategy. OK. Understand the challenges and responsibilities of digital publishing. Your brand message and quality should be consistent with other platforms. If you spell it's correctly in letters, don't spell it wrong on Instagram. Accessibility. Does your language keep people out? There's a lot of words that we use in the art space that don't, that aren't necessarily known in more mainstream, um, in, in other, fields, right? So I take the word formal. To most people, formal is like the prom, right? It's an, you know, it's like your finest clothes. So if you go in and start talking about the formal qualities of an object, then the person is made to feel that they shouldn't be there in a way because the language is already excluding them. And I mean, accessibility in every way, shape or form, but start with the words and make sure that it's clear what you're talking about and the person doesn't have to do a heavy intellectual lift. Intention, how does this convey who you are, or what you do? We heard that today. Value for the audience, right? How does it seem, what are, we also kind of heard this today too. What are they getting out of this? This can't be space junk and they have to be getting information. They gotta be getting a point of view. Maybe it's beauty, maybe it's tranquility, maybe it's a take on the news, whatever it is. So in terms of your strategies, I like to say, have one. So. The first thing is really understanding to use the platforms differently. So here's, this is a very interesting feed um, project from Jasmine Pathija. And on the left, we see her Twitter profile. And on the right, we see the Instagram profile. And we see that the content and the photos are different because she's taking advantage of the qualities of each platform. The other thing is, is that she has this campaign called I Never Ask For It. And this is part, she founded a group called Blank Noise. And what this campaign does is that it, it's centered mostly in India and it draws attention to sexual violence. These women sleep outside in parks, right? So it's drawing attention to the problem and kind of creating a safer space. And the social media is built into this from the very beginning. So let's just start with the bio. We saw a few, who are you? You got 150 characters that include your words, emoji and hashtags and one link. So the first thing I just wanna say about this in terms of the profile photos, now more than ever, you gotta have them for all these zooms and whatnot, but you wanna make yourself findable. It doesn't all have to be the same picture. So I just love this one of Ricardo Gonzalez because this is a case where there's not only other people with this name, but there could be other artists with this name. But if you know anything about him at all, you see the drawn hand and you know which one it is. Share identity. So there's a lot of different things you can put on here. You don't, I mean, if you wanna write just artist, it's all good. I know a lot of people do that, but you could, you know, part of your identity might be where you're from, where you live, groups, causes, right? Maybe you have your art practice, but may, again, we have many practices. Maybe you're a writer, maybe you're a performer. And you might, if you have a show up, if you just won an award, you got an article, something like that, you might want to put it in there. The thing I want to say about this is that it's, I think it's more interesting to search for a kind of essence rather than giving them the whole thing. In other words, like you could write, I'm a painter, a printmaker, a sculptor, a performer, and 
well, now I can't remember the rest of my list, but the point is I come away not knowing anything about you. And I, it's kind of funny because when I do this, people always get so upset about the printmaking. And I'm like, it's okay. You'll, you'll find about, they can find out about the printmaking later. And that's why I like this one from Nayland Blake because it's hilarious. It reads like prose. Artist, educator, instigator, gender, gender gaseous, multiracial, lousy at choice, but thrilled by human creativity. I'm happiness between, I'm happiest between definitions, they, them, please. All right, I'm not saying you should do this. It doesn't have to be like um, the electric Kool-Aid acid test or something, but again, it's, it's kind of more interesting for the reader if you're conveying your essence rather than just a list. So what happens in Instagram is that because we don't have the cover photo, the grid functions as your portrait. And I think it's kind of interesting to look at these two on the left, we've got Hank Willis Thomas, just a screenshot of his grid from some time ago. And on the right, I have the Laundromat Project, which is a change making organization, right? So there's, there's a couple of things you can see. You can see that there's, when you're working in the space of change and activism, graphic design, which we heard so much about already, is so important. And here's just a couple examples of it. First of all, you see that the letters are like illuminated, right? It's like illuminated type that the letters turn into an actual part of the artwork um, in all of these different cases. And there's almost like a kind of an activist font, right? But the other thing that design does, and we're gonna see more shortly, is that it helps the reader process the information. And, and I would urge you when you're talking about the color, certainly in the social media, make them work. Every color has to be there to help in the concept. And you'll see here, there's a lot of different colors and they have different gradients and whatnot, but there's a consistency there that lets me process all the different information. And that's what we're trying to use design for, not so much to draw attention to itself. What to post? So what you're trying to do generally is about you, people, places, and things in your life, which includes your art process, practice, right? Your process influences and events, and not just about you amplify people and causes. The thing I wanna say here is that one reason that people find this so much work is that they write a lot, all right? If you wanna write a lot, it's all good, but it's a lot of work. If we let the picture do the talking, then we don't have to write so much. And then we just gotta use the language to say what it is. So I just wanna give you two reasons why. Here's this, I posted this David Hammonds a couple of days ago and it was shared by a couple of different people in their stories. On the left, you can see that someone shared it with just my handle, right? And on the right, this is a different, but you to push a different button and it comes up with the first two lines of type, right? So that's so interesting. So you wanna make that real estate work. The other thing happens is that if people are just scrolling down your feed, it's the same thing. You gotta make them hit more. Every time they have to hit a button, you're gonna lose some of them. It's just human nature. nature. Share things you see in the world or your head. I like this, the Astro gaze, right? It's just, it's like a picture of his brain, his process. These are the kind of things that you're revealing as an artist. Studio, where the magic happens. So I like to say this, like you can't say, write about my art and you can't say, put me in your show, but you can say, come to my studio. So you kind of wanna use your social to show where the magic happens. How do these humble materials come together through the transformative power of your creativity and become an artwork. Now in social practice, this can be more challenging, but we're trying to, as I keep saying, demystifying your practice in clear, accessible language. So here's an example I took from Studio Museum, right? Where it started, here's Sable Smith in her studio. Um, and it, it has a quote, um, well, it's from a magazine, right? Talking about the actual prison space is a tangible thing to locate a viewer. So the work is about prison in some aspects, but it's also about these larger things that have relationship to everyone. I thought that was so good in these two lines. And then it goes on to say, current artist in residence, Sable Lee Smith, reflects on her conceptual practice, right? So it doesn't come in from the top and say, this is conceptual art, which would keep people out because they might not be sure what it is because it's very, 
complicated, right? But it's a very gentle way of taking the person in and she's situated in the studio. And again, no matter what kind of art you're doing, you got a studio full of stuff. You got your mood board, you got materials, you got, um, there's always some great still lives to be had in the studio. But I wanted to uh, focus briefly on the field. When you're starting these projects, I wrote unique and intuitive hashtag. What does that mean? So here's an example from the drawing center this summer, a hundred drawings from now. If you look and on this hashtag, you're only gonna be seeing posts from this show. Super useful for tracking coverage, right? So before you start, research the hashtags in your space. Now this is super important in social change because when you go on Twitter, it's gonna be like, save the ocean, save the oceans, save our oceans. Like there's gonna be 200 hashtags that you can choose from for every small um, subgroup in these, in these categories. So you wanna look around and see which ones are more popular with the groups that you are working with. The other thing I wanna say is that both Twitter and Instagram tell you clearly they don't want you to use 20 or 30 hashtags, right? Especially if they're words like art and blue, like things are not gonna come to you that way. So it's better to use the more specific ones. Also, they've instituted these new keywords. So if you put the words in the profile, they're starting to function more like hashtags. All right, so before we start, this fits in with everything else we saw earlier. We're back to, I never ask for it because this is a case where there's gonna be submitted content. You have to be checking the hashtag, right? To see who used the hashtag in the actions. I mean, and I'm sure they're coordinated. So there's gotta be systems, right? So you wanna have spreadsheets for your partner handles and information. Imagine this going around to all different cities and with different partners in, in different fields. You wanna get your folders all from the beginning with your photos and info, create your systems and then assign tasks and responsibilities. This is like, who's gonna be in charge of these pictures? Who's shooting at each event? Are you, are you getting vertical and horizontal? Are you, do you have a naming system? Are you saving them ahead of time? You're gonna need all that. Research the space you are in. Now say that you're working in the space of decarceration. Before you go up there and start posting, spend some quality time. So on the left, I did a screenshot of the Marshall Project. And then on the right, there's a screenshot. This is a folder inside my Instagram called Criminal Justice Reform. So Instagram is kind of like Pinterest, in case you didn't know, and it lets you save things in different folders, right? So these are different posts from different organizations. And you can see some consistency of strategies. Like first you have this, I might call it visualization. So they're using illustration in this case to visualize emotions or situations that can't be, for various reasons, um, illustrated in photography, right? And they're also using visualization of data because the subject that we're dealing with is so huge that they need this transformative power of the visualization to help people comprehend and understand it in all these different ways. Then you're gonna see humanization, right? This idea of, of portraiture constantly throughout these and then you're gonna see constantly the power of collective action. How are people coming together to make things happen? Create a visual strategy. I mean, this, this is an awesome one from Mel Chin, right? So Mel Chin has been working for years on this problem of Chinese lead poisoning in New Orleans. And this is one and all over the country. And this is one of the ways he draws attention to it is that he calls it the Fundred Project and people can do these different bills with their portraits. And there's obviously a lot of images that are made very well for social sharing, which is one of the main ways that we get out organic content in social media. So if you think about this from the beginning, what are the ways that we can center the public? We heard a different strategy about that in, from design earlier, but in the Instagram, it's super important from the beginning. And again, to do this, you need to have your photographers in place. Graphic identity. Well, I didn't, um, just to stop briefly on this, I, this is a post by Sonia Guignan Selka. And just to, again, reiterate what we heard before, if you just look at the font, just look at the letters and you're already getting a sense of the person's identity, right? The design helps people process all of this different information that you've put up here. And these are so important because when you're doing these Zoom events, half the time people forget to write where they are. I mean, it's really hard to find out what's going on these days. 
So when you're on these panels, if you have the power of it to, to design these properly, really think about using every piece of the real estate to get your message out and your mission. And then just find almost finally calls to action. How can people help you? All right. Now, if you just go out with like, please help us, that's not going to be that useful for you because you want to give them a couple ways in. You want to give them a way in that doesn't involve giving money. Like, can they give materials? Are there other things they can do, right? That it doesn't, you're not necessarily going to be like put saying like, help us out. Then you might think, what are my urgent needs, right? And in, in, in the case of like, are you looking for space? Do you need certain partners? And then I wrote, what is ROI for you and the givers? What is the return on the investment with this change making, right? Because it's to change when you're, you're when you're helping with change making, you're also changing yourself, right? This isn't just like buying an artwork, right? To help the, the in in social practice means to to be trying to heal the world in some way, right? And then during these projects, we want to be we already narrative, right? Gather images, take people's contact information when you shoot them. Take the testimonials if you can, in case you need them. Post details and process during this to build interest. You could be storyboarding it, designing the content specifically for Instagram and Twitter, tagging your partners and collaborators to inspire more social sharing, and then reviewing it as a whole. Look over this content and to assure what representational justice, right? Do you have a mix of different genders, races, ages, are you privileging the artist instead of the public? Be a character in your story. Now, I know some people don't want to appear in their Instagrams. And I'm like, you know, it's been a hundred years since a portrait had to have the image of a person in it. And I love this one. It's not a selfie from Mel Chin. Here's, um, cause someone else took the picture. So this is Mel Chin, who we just saw his funded project. And here he is a couple of years ago talking to Nancy Pelosi. And I love this because the center of the picture is not Mel Chin, which is what he says. More evidence later, but a quick chapter, capture of Wayne Atlow, Nola Fundred artist at age nine, now 19, making sure I stay coherent. So he's put the center on his, his colleague, on this artist that he's mentored, and the side eye and the gazes, this is like out of Velasquez already. Um, another shout out to Laundromat, because what we're trying to do here in these projects is convey the transformative power of change making. These projects are so big. How can we, these problems rather, are so large in the world. How do you solve things like decarceration and climate change, right? But it's this idea of coming together, of using the power of the creativity and of the collaborative. Then I just did a quick after what's the impact short and long term of the project if there's various ways and a lot of these don't end right just like the project doesn't go away. And you want to be sharing the press. And then I just wanted to add this in here because what happens is that when you're working in the change making space it's like sometimes you can be working in the community one day, and then the next day you're at like the art fair having a champagne and sometimes this way this kind of thing makes its way into the social in a way that's not necessarily ideal. And in every case, again, like these are these are different posts, obviously, of parties where it's it's so much more about the creativity and the community than the fact that they're trying they're there to raise money at a, at a you know at an exclusive event. Confused how you make Twitter curated lists. So when you're on Twitter, say that you go. Um, you, you open my Twitter feed and you want to do a list of Instagram people. That doesn't make sense. Whatever, whatever list it is, you're going to click that you're going to see some dots or buttons and I, um, they're going to be at a different place in your phone and your computer, but the, the, the dots will open up a menu and one of the menus will say save to list. Then you'll have an option to save it to a list that you made already or a list that you're going to name now. And the other thing is to poke around and use other people's lists because a lot of the lists are public and that's a way of making the website, I mean, the Twitter more like a website because people pass through to get to the lists. Bringing up Miriam Basilio, how about that? So what I, uh, can you, you can see this, right? So as you can see, I just clicked on her face. Oops. 
and removed from lists. Um, so if you go, if you add it on there, it will give you, I can have private lists and public lists, right? So I can put it in a, pro, say that you're going to talk to an organization and you know, you're going to a meeting at the Rockefeller Foundation and you can go in and create a folder of all different people who work there or artists that got grants from there or whatever it is to, you know, to inform yourself or you might have a public list or you might create a new list. And then you're gonna click on the different buttons to follow them. Did that explain it? What you're always gonna see on Twitter are these dots that are gonna give you menus. Always look for dots and lines in Twitter. What's the goal of using hashtags? I don't use them or click on them myself. So I'm having trouble understanding what the point is other than for like keywords. Um, so the, th the hashtag is like a hot link. Here's the thing of the hashtag. It's a hot link that anyone who clicks on that link will get linked to every other reference of the hashtag. So if you're using it like a hundred drawings from now, then you'll click on that and everyone who used that hashtag will find all the other coverage. So sometimes if people, I actually asked Rosario Giraldis, who was one of the curators of that show, what hashtags was she looking for because they curated that show during the pandemic? And she said more specific hashtags. So say that you're looking at a specific kind of drawing or a specific kind of print, you're doing research for them now. And then also people use them for the activist campaign. So again, the Me to Sleep campaign only works if people are hashtagging it and using that to get the content out. What happens is that people begin to think that hashtag, like the more the merrier in terms of hashtags, because you might as well pick up everything, you know, NYC, NYC artist, art, contemporary art. But then if you go and look at some of those, you'll see that there's posts that have like four likes and 30 hashtags. And my other theory about it is that the more words you have on a page, the less chance that people will see the ones you want. So we're trying to focus a little bit more on the kind of content that we make and kind of explaining our practice than using specific hashtags. Again, when you're working in climate change, there's gonna be certain ones um, that certain groups use this, you know, again, with all of um, the incarceration the same, and you can look around and see what your colleagues are using and using a few so that if people come, if people are looking for that, right, then they're gonna find you as well. Oh, the other thing I want to say about the hashtags is that you can follow them in Instagram, right? So that if you, I mean, I would certainly be following my name, right? If you're doing a project like Me to Sleep, you can, it gives you an option to follow the hashtag and then you can track all the different coverage, um, all the different times that people are using that hashtag. Twitter and Instagram both have really awesome help session sections. So I just want to end it there. Thank you.